Hello, I'm Tonio Freitag and I'm a technical artist at the R&D department at Animationsinstitut. I'm here to talk about virtual production projects at Film Academy. Virtual production has been a big topic at Film Academy for many years now. We try to get students in contact with these cutting edge technologies as early as possible and encourage them to realize their creative visions in the most effective ways. One of these projects is the Set Extension Workshop. It has a long tradition of being shot in front of a green screen or blue screen, but in recent years has switched to a curved LED wall. In the set extension workshop, we bring together students of cinematography, production design and animation visual effects to create a live action short film heavily enhanced by visual effects. The students have to complete this visual effects heavy production from start to finish but to keep the workload realistic, we limit parameters like shot count and the overall length of the film. Still, there is a lot to do. In just three months, the team has to develop an original story, write a script and design all the assets and everything their movie needs. Once the script is written and concepts are finished, the production designers immediately start to build the set, create props and costumes, while the VFX artists are joined by the cinematographers in creating storyboards, animatics and previs. Since this is an LED wall production, with a goal of capturing final images on set, all the creative decisions have to be made before the shoot, and all the assets have to be finished as well. When all this is prepared and tested, the students have at most two days of shooting with the LED wall, followed by just a few weeks of post-production. Here to talk about their experience and their film Awakening is the team from the most recent Set Extension Workshop. Hello, my name is Svenja Weber and I'm the producer of the Set Extension Workshop 2021-2022 at Animation Institute. In this workshop, 18 students from different departments come together to create a short film using virtual production techniques. Hello everyone, my name is Philipp Dörrer and I'm currently studying animation and visual effects in the second year of the Animationsinstitut of the Filmakademie Baden-Württemberg. I was the visual effects supervisor for the pre-production and on set. Hi, I'm Eileen Kammer and I'm the art director of the movie. Hi, my name is Benjamin Getschmann. I am also studying animation and visual effects in my second year at Animations Institute of Film Academy Baden-Württemberg. And for this project, I was working as a visual effects supervisor for our post-production. And on set, I was also working as an Unreal operator for color matching. For our pre-production workflow, it was really important to support the exchange between the different departments early on. That's where we appointed our art director at the VFX crew, who would then go to support the production designers in concept art. The concept art was then helping us to create more assets earlier and quicker. This was also done using procedurally generated assets, as well as photogrammetry assets. But to enable all of this, a good planning was also needed. That's why we took a lot of the measurements really early on. And we're also given a mock-up of the Albrecht Ade Studio, which is really important when you plan a virtual production. We then set up a TechVis or also Previs, which enabled us to create and test all of the shots that we were planning. Therefore, we use Blender Eevee to have real-time feedback and do a lot of iterations really quickly. We also used real-time shaders, uh, which, were, which enabled us to have measurements in real-time as well as also visualizations of specific uh, warnings or errors which could come up when you're working with a virtual production or in this case an LED wall. We implemented a measurement system in our previous so we could see the distances between the camera and the wall 
the camera and the actress, the actress and the LED wall and the camera height all the time and provide these measurements to our production design and cinematography department. We also developed some warning systems to erase possible problems as soon as possible. So for example, we have a Moré warning system that lights up when the camera focus gets too close to the LED wall. We also have a warning system for the motion capture volume so we can make sure the camera stays within the mocap volume all the time. We also have a warning system for the edge of the LED wall so we can make sure we don't shoot beyond the LED wall. One of the key elements we learned during pre-production was that no department can make changes without it influencing the other departments. So really strong and open communication is key. In the early phases of our production, parallel to the previous, we in the art department tried to figure out how to get the size of our cave right. We knew what we wanted to tell, but conveying it and making it somewhat believable was a whole other issue. We started out with 2D concepts and continued to 3D layouts, but soon realized that we had limits what we could experience only on our monitors. Since we didn't really have the access to the LED wall, we tried to figure out how to get an alternative solution for that. Soon our technical director, Justus Henne, came up with the idea of using a VR headset to experience our cave and to see our limitations and actually figure out the size and the spacing of our assets. And even the cinematographers joined in to figure out camera positions and which lenses to use. All in all, the VR headset was a great tool for us to use during this production phase and make the transition from our computers to the LED wall much more comfortable because we had a feeling of what to expect. And we even used it for set dressing later on. Since our story takes place in an ice cave, it was clear to us that we would have to populate the entire environment with a lot of assets. To enable this, we used Houdini's procedural asset generation capabilities. We created a rock generator, which allowed us to create a lot of rocks and pebbles and boulders using overlaying noise patterns and then adding some detail afterwards in Substance Painter. The same setup was also used in our cave pillars generator. There we also used some volume-based masking, which allowed us to blend different materials into each other, such as ice and rocks. We also had an icicle painter tool, which allowed artists to paint icicles on top of existing geometry as well as a vein generator which used existing input geometry to spread veins uh, as a geometry on top of the existing geo. Yeah. So when you're actually shooting with an LED wall and you're on set, you're confronted with a lot of different things that you might not have thought about in pre-production. For example, you have to perfectly synchronize the refresh rate of the LED wall with the shutter of your camera. For example, if you have your camera set to 25 FPS, it's not enough to set the refresh rate of the LED wall to a multiplication of 25, for example, 25 or 50, because you have to synchronize the exact time in the second where the refreshing starts. So, because otherwise you would again get weird artifacts. So, here's the combination that we use on our shoot. And it is really, really helpful to know these things in advance so you can plan with them. Another thing to keep in mind is color spill because the panels have a little spill depending on the uh, angle that you look at them. So, if you look at them from below, you get a slightly more bluish tint. I think it's not as problematic if you don't have white, but in our case, you could see it pretty easily. So let's say you want to change the brightness of your scene on the LED wall. We set the brightness on the control units for the LED panels to at least 70%, because the higher the brightness on these control units, um, the more accurate the color from the LED panels will be. And then for actually darkening the scene, we just used post-processing in Unreal and we got pretty good results with that. Another really important thing is um, how to create a seamless transition from your set into the Unreal scene. Um, and for that we used post-processing volume. We always had one parented to the camera and then we could adjust only the region of the LED wall where it connects to the set. And we always just used the camera view as reference. So we never looked at the set, only the camera view because that is what matters. And it turned out pretty well for us.
Looking back at our workshop, we definitely learned a lot, especially regarding the lighting phase, which is such an important step within the Visual Effects production pipeline. This also goes for virtual production. You should have a working lighting setup way before shoot, and it should be closely communicated with your DOP. This also goes for tech checks. You should check all your setups in Unreal way before your shoot. Everything should be working out there already. We, for example, had problems with Niagara within our in-camera thrustum with particles not showing up. Or, for example, the uh, environment painting tool uh, causing glitches within our in-camera thrustum. One thing I definitely learned is do not sacrifice too much visual quality for flexibility on set because we didn't use any baked lighting. Um, we wanted to preserve as much lighting flexibility on set, um, but instead just work on multiple lighting situations, just switch them out on set um, and see what works best. Another thing is closed setting like a cave is uh, more challenging than an open space environment. You have geometry all around you that takes a lot of computing power. Um, so if you have a if you want to have a light fast running scene, just go for an open environment with a skybox that doesn't need to be calculated and you're good to go. Yeah, that's it for our presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to get in touch, feel free to contact us. And we wish you a great time here at FMX. Bye. A student project that pushes the use of technology on several fronts is directed by Carly Coco. She and her team are working on Cyber City Love Story, which is our biggest transmedia project to date. It starts out on film and was shot in beautifully designed sets, partially extended by the use of a curved LED wall. Later the viewer switches to VR to experience the rest of the story in virtual reality. As you can imagine, combining traditional filmmaking, virtual production and non-linear storytelling in a VR game in one project is a huge challenge. Almost all departments at Film Academy were involved in the realization of this project. Here to talk about their experience is the team of Cyber City Love Story. What you will witness now is a glance behind the scenes of our unique story world. A completely new format that merges virtual reality game with cinematic storytelling. I am Kali Koko and I am the director and creator of Cyber City Love Story, a transmedia series that beams us into the year 2094 where a new society of scientists create an even more advanced future, while a teenage girl lives the life of being a high schooler. But see for yourselves. You don't enjoy this. It's breathtaking. Yes, it's gonna be if you stay here. Yes, you've seen correctly, our 15-year-old protagonist Elaine lives on Mars. 
the new home for scientists to build a newer and better Earth. But yeah, Mars is far from being the beautiful blue home planet that we all know. It has no oxygen and it's insanely cold. So freezing to death would come right after suffocating. And there's very little sunlight due to constant dust in the atmosphere. But how could we portray a new world that isn't even there yet? In world building sessions with every department present, we discussed how to design the film that it would fit our premise. Since humans can't go outside on Mars, the idea was to design a world that makes humans feel as comfortable as possible inside. As this is a scientific society with a very work-prone lifestyle, we decided on a simplistic concept of interior design. No clutter, very pleasant soundscapes, no distractions. While everything in this Martian world is designed to adapt to humans to make their lives easier, it also had to reflect the loneliness and boredom that our protagonist feels and that makes her ultimately break the rules. But as if creating a futuristic Martian world isn't hard enough, the story takes us into another, even more complex world. A virtual reality game that was the shit in the 2030s, but is completely forgotten and retro in 2094. So to create this kind of futuristic retro vibe, we analyzed many online games of the last 20 years and decided to have our game have the same kind of nostalgia that we feel when we're touching an old Game Boy. Our game Cyber City is full of pop cultural references. Not just from the 80s, no, we include every time period, even the ones that haven't come yet. So by anticipating what the music style might be like in the 2030s, mainly songs that only contain one word, we created a new pop era that doesn't exist. Next to all the fun chaos, Cyber City had to fit the purpose of our story. The VR game had to enchant our main character by being so rich of adventures that it's the complete opposite to a home on Mars. After planning out our world in sketches and previses and building plans, we had to make it now come to life by actually building it. As we don't own a space agency that can take us to Mars, we had to make Mars come to us. By using two of our studios to build four different sets in, we were able to fully control and adjust not only the interior design, but also the lighting, which made it easier to integrate the film lighting into our set design. But most of all, being able to shoot with the LED wall created a seamless transition between our set design and outer Mars. The key moment of our series pilot takes place outside the Martian buildings, so it was crucial to experience the freedom that our protagonist feels, but also witness the loneliness of the Red Planet. Since Mars was built digitally in Unreal Engine, we were able to tweak and perfect the landscape while we were on set. This gave me the ultimate freedom to direct the scene exactly as I envisioned it. Oh hey, I didn't see you there. My name is Ali Schäfer. I'm the game director of Cyber City Love Story and also the environment artist for the LED wall sets. Working with the LED wall technology was a great experience but also had some risks until the very last shot. As we were lucky enough to try out this new technology almost exactly a year before our shoot, we kind of had an idea which opportunities and problems we are facing. Our in-house research and development team did a fantastic job in supporting us, be it in providing us the actual 3D files of the studio or mentoring us in uh, real-time lighting for the LED wall sets or by simply catching up on a regular basis and giving us feedback. By scanning the materials of our build set, we were able to match the materials of the digital extension. Needless to say, I felt a great relief when I first saw my scene for the very first time through a camera, and a much bigger relief when I realized that all our plans are working out. One of the biggest challenges in transmedia projects is to bridge the gap between the different medias. As we don't want the game to appear like a gimmick to the series, but to be an essential part of it, it was crucial to design it in a way where we can pick up the viewer and immediately turn him into a player. As we had a tough timetable during each of our shooting blocks, we did not have always the time to use the best possible solution. So for example, instead of using real photogrammetry to capture our reference scenes, we used the LiDAR technology in Apple devices to capture the mood, the lighting and the correct aspects of the set very fast. As we are telling a story about an open world game with lots of possibilities, 
We focus on adapting different mechanics from games like shooters, puzzles or racing games and put them in a single player VR experience. Especially in the grinding part, we had to focus on how to reduce the possibility of motion sickness as we do not want the user to skip the ride. For this case, different prototypes were made and best practice tips from the industry were tried out. For example, giving the user the feeling of full controls of the mechanics, narrowing the field of view by designing closed segments, but then again opening up occasionally to benefit from the 360 view, designing a main and easy road and add some branches for more intense gameplay. And also, we had to focus on asynchronous level streaming to still be able to play it on the Oculus Quest 2. And therefore, we needed a performant and unique art style. Hi, uh, I'm Hazel, I'm the art director of Cyber City Love Story. And, well, it's always easier said than done to create something unique. Um, because, well, we live in 2022 and a lot has been done before. Especially when you hear a word like uh, Cyber City, your mind is probably immediately, immediately filled with uh, Things like Blade Runner or Cyberpunk, just these huge neon mega cities with neon signs and then cables everywhere. But that's not an aesthetic that made sense for our project, since uh, Cyber City Love Story takes place in a purely digital space uh, inhabited by uh, real players. For inspiration, uh, we looked at, for example, big Minecraft servers and how users and modders have uh, shaped those places over time. And what we found was uh, really cool and uh, really random. Uh, and that randomness is very good because chaos and anarchy are what we need. But how do you plan and execute something like that in a production environment? What we've been trying to do is uh, we are trying to enable our artists to just um, add whatever they like to uh, a base architecture that uh, can be found in the game and that represents what was in the game before users started modding it. The style we all came up with uh, is all about simplicity and contrast. A contrast between normal architecture and very abstract uh, and weird digital elements. A contrast between simple and complex in terms of shape, detail, texture, etc. Because I feel like if everything is special, weird and overwhelming in this space, then nothing stands out and you can't appreciate the weirdness and the randomness for what it is. So we try to highlight something extraordinary by putting it next to something ordinary. Another design approach that kind of plays into this is to just take something we can all recognize uh, and to alter it in a weird way. Like for example, replacing a character's skin texture with an error message. Hi, I'm Nadia and I'm one of the producers of Cyber City Love Story, especially the film part of the project. And um, yeah, that's what we're here to talk about today, uh, kind of how we proceeded with the workflow for the film part. Because we had like a lot of sets to manage that we couldn't fit all into one studio and also the resources we needed to manage, we needed to lay out like in a longer period of time, we decided to shoot the film part of the project in three shooting blocks which were like a few weeks apart each. Yeah, and I think that was a really nice challenge for us to like hold the project over such a long time, hold the team together over such a long time for the shooting. So to bring all of these parts together, the like real shooting parts, the VFX parts, the LED wall, which was a form of VFX kind of, but also not because it's of course happening live while you're on set shooting the film. To bring all of that together, that was kind of a challenge because some team members, of course, me included, weren't that experienced with that kind of uh, workflow yet. So that was a really, really good experience for us to learn how to, yeah, combine those techniques. Hi, I'm Julius and I'm the producer of the VR game for Cyber City Love Story. The non-linear part of the whole project also needs a lot more a non-linear approach to producing. So we, plan, we try to plan everything as well we can beforehand, but we also know that there will be things during production that will need to be changed because we notice that certain things don't work out the way that we want them to work out. To kind of give you an idea what the workflow is like, so it would start out that we sketch out the level like in a very basic way, find like some beats that we want to have in there coming from the story, and then we start blocking that level inside Unreal Engine. In parallel to that, we also start making concept art for the level, what everything is supposed to look like, get some like images that we want, some keyframes, and out of that concept art, we then start creating an asset list. That asset list is pretty much like worked off and we create all the assets that we need. They are then implemented into the level, which by now also has the gameplay that we want. And then there's this big back and forth between iterating the gameplay and adding assets and changing assets around, making everything look right, but also make it feel right. 
And it's a constant loop of iterations that at the end gives you a result of a game that is nice to play, looks right, the gameplay matches with the level design and the level dressing, and everything fits together. Thank you so much for listening to our talk. I also want to thank Edie Baumann, the head producer of Cyber City Love Story, who made this whole project a reality. And a huge shout out to Lana Doblinghausen, who wrote the scripts and had a big part in the world building process. Lastly, a big thank you to Mac Next, which is co-producing the project. If you have any questions or want to get in touch, feel free to drop us a line. Bye. Thanks to our students for giving us an insight into their projects. And thanks to you for joining. If you are interested in studying at Animationsinstitut, please find all the information at animationsinstitut.de. See you at FMX.